What romances have I been watching lately? What romances have you been watching lately? I have very little idea. I haven't been watching things lately. I thought you never forced yourself to watch literally anything that we're not doing for the podcast. Other than, like, YouTube reviews of modems. I watched the Doctor Strange movie. Oh, did you? There was not a romance between Benedict Cumberbatch and the 14-year-old protagonist. Which makes it different from this show. I was gonna say! (laughs) Uh, There's an opener. Hello listeners, welcome to the Non-Toxic Fanboys Podcast, where the name is aspirational, and where we remain in the Time Traveler's Wife cinematic universe, this time discussing the new HBO series written by Stephen Moffat, better known as the most hated man on Tumblr the last time I was on Tumblr. Of course, if spoilers are a concern for you, dear listener, we are going to be discussing the entire show and its relationship to the book, and maybe its relationship to the movie that we discussed in our last episode, so be warned. I am Glenn, and with me is Scott. Scott, if you had your choice, would you rather be the time traveler or the time traveler's wife? I would not fare well turning up at random locations at random times with no clothes and no money. So I'll have to go with being the wife. Anyone who knows me knows that one of my most hated things is instability and unpredictability. So yes, give me the role that has all of the clothes and all of the relative security and the lottery winnings. Are there lottery winnings? I don't remember that from this show. They alluded to the lottery winnings, in the same scene with the stock tips. Last time, when we discussed the film, I said that the most important thing about adapting The Time Traveler's Wife is to convey the relationship between the two leads, and to really use that as a grounding element. I'm going to say that in this show... The relationship between Theo James and Rose Leslie as the leads, I think, was conveyed better than in the movie. I think they had chemistry at various points. I think it wasn't quite as successful as it could ideally have been, but I think it had some very good moments. I could not disagree more. Yeah, I figured. I mean, at least in the movie, they didn't really seem to be in love the way they were in the book, but at least they seemed like they could tolerate each other. They couldn't stand each other in this show. Like, at one point in episode 5, they're having a conversation, it's something like, what do you like about this relationship or whatever, and one of them says, I'm really enjoying the sex. And I'm like, are these people having sex? Because for the last four episodes, they can't stand each other. Oh, they're all over each other for the first two episodes. Really? They do have quite a bit of sex, yes. Did we see the same show? Where she, like, screams at him and, like, starts throwing things at him and storms out of his apartment and he sort of follows after her but doesn't actually follow after her to the point where he gets to talk to her? He just sort of lets her leave? That happens after quite a bit of sex, yes. That happens after one instance of sex. And then in the third episode, they have their first dinner together, and it's a huge melodrama catfight thing with his old girlfriend, who apparently in this show isn't so old, because that's what needed to be added to the story of the time traveler's wife, was Claire and Ingrid having some sort of snippy catfight over who gets to date Henry, because he's such a catch at this point. And like... All she has done is complain about Henry not being enough like her memories of older Henry. And like as soon as older Henry shows up, she gloms onto him and completely ignores younger Henry, who she's ostensibly dating. Who, as I said, she doesn't appear to be able to stand the presence of, barely. Which is completely understandable, because for the most part, he treats her like crap. Like, I don't understand why the writers... And 
I say the writers. Was there any writer on this other than Stephen Moffat? It's been many years since I've watched Doctor Who, so I'm not really equipped to engage in Moffat discourse. But, like, other than the author of the novel, he is the only credited writer on this, right? So, like, whenever I complain about the writers or complain about creative choices, it's all Moffat, right? Uh, yes. So, like, why did Moffat decide that every character needed to be rewritten so that their defining character trait is now asshole? I did find there to be a bit too much conflict. <laughs> I think that's how this episode is going to go. You're going to rail against something for five minutes, and then I'm going to sigh and, like, 10% agree. I kept having the thought watching this. I read a description once of someone was describing their preferences in romance stories. But it's really applicable to any story with romance in it. It doesn't have to be a romance story. And I had had similar thoughts before, and I could express them to you if you give me three or four paragraphs, but this person explained it in six words. <laughs> okay. In stories that have a romance in them, what I want from the romance is drama around them, not between them. These two people love each other, they are in a relationship, and he randomly disappears to Peoria, Illinois in 1987. And that's an obstacle they have to deal with. Not he already has a girlfriend that he didn't tell her about before he takes her to bed, and he keeps treating her like crap because he's just an asshole to everybody. That's not the conflict I want to see. Don't show me like, you know, he cheated on her and she did something to him and they're mutually pining for one another and all of this could be cleared up if they had like a 10 second conversation, but instead they're going to spend five years off and on wishing they could be together. That's not what I'm looking for in a romance storyline. Just show me two people that are in a romance, they love and support each other, but one of them just randomly time travels away and they can't control that and they have to deal with it. That's the sort of romance storyline I can enjoy in a show. Don't give me this, he never told her he had a girlfriend, and then he just keeps sniping at her, and then she snipes back at him, but somehow they're also together? Somehow? Well, I don't know, we're talking about Moffat, and suddenly I've got Amy and Rory on the brain. And how suddenly in the start of Series 7, they're divorcing and snipping at each other, and that's not what I want out of their relationship. I don't want to make too, too many comparisons to the movie, but one of the things that really disappointed me about that, that I think we talked about at some length, was how all of the characters had all the edges filed off of them, like, aggressively. And I think this TV show maybe leans a little too far in the other direction, where the characters are spiky, but they're maybe a little too spiky. Well, they're not spiky in the way they are in the book. They're just spiky in some way that Moffat invented. You know, Henry doesn't treat Claire like crap in the book. Henry doesn't lie to Claire in the book. Not even when he's 40 and she's 12. You know, he avoids answering some questions. He, he flat out says, I won't tell you that to some questions. But he doesn't lie to her. He doesn't lead her to make decisions based on incorrect information. And we'll talk about that storyline. but. So much of what in the book is sort of an interesting, nuanced reaction to very difficult circumstances is turned into the show into over-the-top, melodramatic conflict. And so often it's very cliched over-the-top, melodramatic conflict. Like, Claire's family isn't an idealized portrait of love and support, but they're not as bad as they are shown in the show, and they're not bad in the way they're shown in the show. Claire and Ingrid meet at one point, and Ingrid is upset that Henry broke up with her and is with Claire now. But, like, they don't have this whole dinner together where they get in this, like, snippy verbal catfight over who gets to date Henry. That sort of terrible cliche scene is not in the book. That comes from. Well, I guess Moffat. I keep wanting to say the writers, but there's only one writer, so... Indeed there is. When Henry talks about the scene where he has sex with himself, 
he doesn't like go on and on denying that he's gay. He doesn't deny it like four or five, six times. And she keeps trying to explain that he's not actually gay. He just like says it once. Yeah, that is hmm. Ben, the drug dealer in the book is a gay man who is an AIDS patient, but he's not a simpering stereotype the way he is in the show. Well, of course, also transposing the story forward in time, having an AIDS patient who homebrews pharmaceuticals doesn't quite have the bite that it once did. Yeah, that wasn't happening so much in 2008 as it was in 1991. Yeah. So much from the book is changed in order to make the characters more antagonistic toward each other, in order to make the characters treat each other more poorly in order to make the characters have more vocal and expressive conflicts with each other. So much has changed to make everything so much more tired and cliche. And so much has changed just to create, like, over-the-top melodrama instead of the more interesting conflicts in the book that are generated by the circumstances rather than the melodramatic conflicts in the show that are generated by the people and their actions. Like, I really don't want to fall into the trap of just, like, citing anything that was changed from the book and saying that's bad because they changed it from the book. But, like, can you tell me anything they changed from the book that you think was an improvement? If I recall correctly, there are a lot more interactions between, like, multiple Henrys at once than we really get in the book, and, like, longer scenes where there are two Henrys. And I kind of appreciated that. I guess maybe there are a few more. There are places they interact in the show where they didn't interact in the book. Like, Henry didn't meet up with himself after Claire stormed out of his apartment. Because Claire didn't storm out of his apartment. Well, okay, but... (laughs) And Henry didn't talk to himself about the vasectomy. Which, again, they go the route of creating over-the-top dramatic conflict around the vasectomy, similar to how the movie did, when in the book it's not that much of a conflict. In fact, in the book, he doesn't have the vasectomy until Claire agrees to it. I don't know, I just found this so frustrating to watch. Because I really do enjoy the story in the book, and I enjoy the ideas it explores of, like, these strange circumstances and how do you deal with them. Like the scene where Claire has to acknowledge that she's disappointed in young Henry, Because her view of 28-year-old Henry, when she's 20, isn't living up to the ideal that she formed when Henry was 38 and she was 6. And she has to acknowledge that and decide how to react to that. And she has a scene with older Henry where she has to acknowledge that and they discuss it together. And that is a really interesting conflict for Claire to resolve with herself. But... Instead, in the show, we get, like, two entire episodes where she just totally ditches young Henry in favor of an older Henry who showed up. That doesn't deal with the issue as well. It doesn't deal with the issue as thoughtfully. That's another way you could describe a lot of these changes, is that they take a lot of the things that are dealt with a lot more thoughtfully in the book, and it just makes them more cliché and more blatant and less nuanced and less interesting and less thoughtful. I said before when we were talking about how Ben wasn't in the movie at all, the scene where Ben is at Henry's wedding and he knows this Henry is from the future and he asks him, hey, you know, you're from the future. Can you tell me, am I still alive where you come from? That's like a really sweet moment where Henry is able to give his friend that reassurance. A, an AIDS patient in 1991 needs that reassurance a heck of a lot more than your average HIV patient in 2008. Yes. But also, it's a really sweet, tender scene where Ben is so vulnerable and Henry is able to give his friend this reassurance, give his friend this kindness. No one on this show shows any kindness. Everyone on this show is a snippy jerk. Well, we almost get something like that with Ingrid when she's asking older Henry if she's still alive. And old Henry... I think in the way that he deals with her in that moment kind of softens and shows that kind of kindness. But it is a little rare. Yeah, that is kind of the closest they come. I don't know, I just found the whole thing so frustrating. 
Like, especially toward the end, the last couple of episodes, it felt like every couple of minutes I was going, oh, God, are they going to do that? Oh, God, they're doing that. Oh, I had that moment in episode three. Do you remember what happened in episode three? Should we give a content note real quick? If we need a content note, then it's the storyline I'm thinking of. Yes, a uh, quick content note. The following section of the podcast discusses the storyline surrounding the physical and sexual assault of a character. If you wish to skip this part of the discussion, it ends at 24.14. Through the first couple of episodes, I was really, really with the show, like, as its own take on the story, independent of, you know, having to do everything that was in the book, just, like, plowing its own path. I was still optimistic. Mm -hmm. Maybe not optimistic. There was a lot of stuff in the first couple of episodes that I didn't like, but it still had the chance to turn it around. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was still hopeful, if not necessarily optimistic. Uh, yeah. And then I heard on the internet that come episode three, we get the sequence where Claire gives Henry the distinct impression that she has been sexually assaulted and gets him to beat up a kid. Initially tells him he's going to have to kill a kid. This sequence, I feel, did not need to be in an adaptation. It didn't need to be here. We didn't need to see this. Okay, can we just start from the jump? Okay, okay. From the get-go, a woman wrote a book about a 16-year-old girl who was not raped. And a 60-year-old man took that story and said, You know what would make this better? Is if the 16-year-old girl was raped. Is it explicit that she wasn't raped in the book? Yes. Okay. I mean, it's possible to interpret that scene in a way that she's lying, but that is not an interpretation that is really supported by the text. It's pretty clear in the text that she's telling the truth when she says she was not raped. Like, she quotes what he said when he told her that she wasn't even worth raping. Ah, oh, God, yeah. That's not something she would invent as she's tearfully recounting the experience, you know? Yes. So, I mean, I guess you can't say it's 100% certain she wasn't raped in the book, but it's pretty fucking clear that she wasn't raped in the book. Okay. And so, Stephen Moffat adding more rape, or adding any rape, that makes me very uncomfortable. Okay, okay. I appreciate that they do have Claire tell Henry not to make this about how angry he is. That is a very good thing to have if you are going to do this sequence, if you think it's a good idea. Yes, that three seconds was good. The entire rest of it? <laughs> um, I'm not sure the show, as a construct, isn't making it about how angry he is. I don't think the show is making it about how angry he is, but the show handles that whole sequence so fucking terribly. Like, they go and kidnap him from his house, right? And throw him in the trunk and drive away, and then he has an asthma attack. And she says, oh, we have to go back and get his inhaler. And Henry doesn't, like, use that as an opportunity to talk her down. Like, why do we have to get his inhaler if we're just going to kill him? He could use that as an opportunity to, like, talk her down or get her to acknowledge that they're not going to commit murder or talk her out of committing murder. But he doesn't. He just, like, whines and moans. Oh, come on, we don't want to go all the way back there. That moment, if you play up that moment a little more, it's a Coen Brothers bit. We're going to abduct and kill this guy, but we need to get his inhaler. Well, if you play up that moment properly, then it hews a lot more closely to their characterization from the book. Where Henry will do whatever Claire is asking of him, but he would really prefer that she not order a hit. And so he could use that as an opportunity. Why do we need his inhaler if we're just going to kill him anyway? He could use that as an opportunity to talk her down. But he doesn't. He just complains about having to go back. Like in the book, she pulls out the gun and he goes, Shit, why do you have a gun? I don't think we should have this. I'm angry enough I might use it. Therefore, we definitely should not have a gun. And in the show, he's just like, okay, yeah, a gun. 
Also, why did they have that entire aside about her texts? What did that accomplish? Why did that have to be included? Okay, um, two things on the matter of the texts. Number one, just more signposting, hey, we moved this to the semi-modern day. Woo. Number two, it's the sort of thing that a whole lot of assaulters and a whole lot of rapists say, because people do things when they've been traumatized, and so I think it's fine if you're going to do this sequence, which I don't think they should have done. It's just as well to have something like that that's a sort of standard, she's making it up, she asked for it, that's instantly refuted. Well, having him claim she's making it up, she was asking for it, that's fine. But the entire thing about read my texts and she sent me texts and I did send the texts, but here's the explanation for the texts. That just seems like an entire unnecessary diversion from the rest of the storyline. At the very least, I thought she was going to say something like, I did send those texts after the first date. The place where I really noped out of this whole sequence was when Jason lapsed into, she likes it rough, she likes it rough, and Henry screams, she doesn't and she never did, how do you know? Because I'm her fucking husband. And that is the mechanism that the show has for conveying this information to young Claire. This is the way that she discovers this, after he had lied to her about it previously. Yeah, but that's not even the worst part of it to me. The worst part of it is that this whole thing uh, happens... Uh, also, sorry, as, as a quick note, even if she did like it rough, it's still fucking rape. Anyway. The worst part of it to me is that I mean, okay, I gotta be very careful here, because I don't want to be victim-blaming. Like, the rape is entirely the fault of the rapist. Yes. But the reason she went on a date with the rapist is because Henry was so insistent that he and Claire were never in a relationship. If Henry had acknowledged, okay, yeah, we're gonna be together at some point in the future, Claire wouldn't have felt rejected and wouldn't have gone out with Jason. In the book, she goes out with Jason because people are asking questions about why she doesn't date anyone, because she's waiting to meet Henry to date him, and she wants to just end the questions, so she goes on a date with Jason. In the show, she explicitly comes on to Jason because Henry rejected her and told her that the two of them are not together in the future, which turns out to be a lie. Yeah, I didn't enjoy... Henry lying to Claire over and over again about this? Giving my most charitable interpretation, I could see it as the show desperately trying to give Claire more agency by, like, believing that she isn't inevitably going to wind up with Henry so that it becomes her choice. But, oh, I, I really don't think they got there. You don't give someone agency by feeding them false information. That too. Lying to people is in fact a form of manipulation. Mm hmm Whereas telling someone the truth is generally regarded as not manipulative. As long as you're, you know, forthright with it and you're not massaging the truth and only telling a particular part of it or whatever. But yeah. generally, if you're just honest, that's not seen as manipulation. But lying to someone absolutely is a form of manipulation. Very often, yes. I will say, as one redeeming quality of the way the show handled the Jason storyline, that having Claire get into art by turning her abuser into this monument to male entitlement and male violence, that's kind of rad. In retrospect... That entire sequence with Jason, like most of episode three, really, is kind of where this show went off the rails for me. Like episode one, I had some issues with the characterization, but like that could have just been a rough start that would eventually smooth out. Most of episode two, I thought was pretty good. I thought they were course correcting away from the characterization from episode one and back towards something closer to the book. But episode three and the entire Jason storyline is really where the show just went off the rails for good for me. 
After that, it just was miss after miss after miss. Having Ingrid and Old Henry at the dinner with Gomez and Charisse, the introduction to Claire's family and changing all of the issues with Claire's family to be something so much more generic and cliche, and whatever the fuck they did with episode 6, which we can discuss in more detail. Really, after episode 3, it was just all... I'm not saying there was nothing in there that was any good, but in the macro, it was just all lost after that. In retrospect, that is where it went off the rails for good. I was somewhat more positively disposed to the dinner party. I don't think it was really that much of a cat fight. They had some bickering, but I think there was some really good stuff during the dinner party. It just struck me as so... I'm trying to think of another word other than cliche, because I've used that word too much, but two women fighting over who gets to date a guy. Like, that's something we needed added into the story? Yeah, see, I don't think they were fighting over who got to date him. Ingrid knew she wasn't dating him anymore. (laughs) No, I don't think Ingrid acknowledged that until the end. No, I think Ingrid had a pretty good idea. She was just there to sow chaos. Out of spite, for sure. I mean, they kept sniping back and forth when they were making the food. And then Ingrid had that whole speech about, you don't even love Henry. You love that George Clooney guy over there. I love this guy. Oh, and of course, the fourth episode with all of the Ingrid content was where we also had Gomez meeting Henry at some point before the beginning of the show to defend Ingrid from him when they're fighting in the street which is such a Moffat touch. Like, that is incredibly, incredibly Moffat. And like a lot of things that are incredibly Moffat, it's not entirely a good idea. I mean, it's fine enough, I guess, but... mm. I thought that was fine. But there was, like, this whole second time Gomez met Henry before Gomez met Henry that Gomez kept referring to but never actually explained. Yeah, I found the beginning of Gomez and Henry's friendship. Again, the characters are spiky, but I think they're a little too spiky. Like, I wanted them to be friends. Like, there's tension at first, and that's great, and that's fine, but at least by the end of the episode, I wanted them to be friends. You know why that might be? Because in the book, they were friends. Henry didn't have to be told you'll be friends with Gomez. He just developed a friendship with Gomez. And, in what I suppose is a parallel to other dynamics in the show, Henry comes to understand that he's going to be friends with Gomez because older Gomez tells him. Or rather, older Gomez shows him. So much of this show is, like, just the predestination. I had that thought in episode four when Henry and Claire were going to meet her parents, and I'm like, why are they together? They don't seem like they even like each other. Like, is there any reason other than predestination that they're in this relationship right now? Oh, it's bootstrap paradoxes all the way down, baby. And the same question, is there any reason other than predestination that Henry and Gomez become friends? Like, in the book, they get along. They joke around together. They develop a friendship. I don't see that in this show. Also, we've talked before about adaptations including details from the source material without bothering to explain or include any of the supporting details that are the reason for that detail to exist. What did you think of them carrying over Henry calling Gomez comrade, but leaving out Gomez's Marxism that is the reason why Henry calls Gomez comrade? Yeah, Gomez isn't a Marxist. Gomez is a lawyer who gets rich off of Netflix stock and Bitcoin. I hope Henry told him to sell before 2022. (laughs) Well, they did have to update the stock tips. Buy Apple is not such a hot tip now as it was in 1995. Yeah, yeah, they had to update the stock tips to Palladium, Broadcom, and Surgical Masks. Although I did enjoy that scene in the book where Gomez meets Henry from the future, and Henry's like, you ever heard of the internet? It's a computer thing. Just buy it. (laughs) Also bold that Moffat got the Netflix plug-in on an HBO Max show. (laughs) Should have told him to buy Time Warner. Also, sell Netflix before 2022. 
Does Time Warner even still own HBO? That company has gone through so many mergers and sales and splits. Oh, God, I don't know. Ted Turner should buy it. Although I will say, and this, you know, this is always sort of one of those things I pay attention to that no one else really pays this close attention to, but this is my podcast, so here we go. Mm, Okay. They did a really good job showcasing old technology in this show. When Claire meets Henry in 1994, and she sees her brother Mark using a computer, that is the most 1994 computer tower. Do you remember that thing? Yeah, it was pretty nice. It had grooves in the front vent, and then like a triangular cutout. It is such a 1994 computer tower. Oh, it looks so good. Also, the aforementioned Jason scene, when Henry calls himself in 2004 to tell himself he's going to need an alibi, Isabel, at the desk behind Henry, is using a beige LCD monitor. Oh, wow, I didn't notice that. 2004 is a little early for LCDs, but it's not unrealistically early for an LCD. And having it be a beige LCD is an excellent touch, because in 2004, a lot of computers were still computer-colored. Yes. Oh, that's good. And if that was like some sort of text entry terminal for their internal database system, and not like a full desktop PC then that makes the LCD not even that early, because monochrome LCDs on data entry terminals predate full-color LCDs on desktop PCs. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that was an excellent touch. The cell phone that Henry uses when they're driving to Claire's parents. In the book, that scene takes place at Christmas, the year that Henry and Claire meet. In the show, that is in 2008. Of course, in the show, they sit outside in the yard and have drinks or breakfast or whatever that is. That whole sequence is weird to me because they drive all the way out to her parents' house. They have this meal out in the yard. Then they come back inside and Henry and Claire have their whole conversation about the past and old things. Then Henry meets Alicia and all of that is all happening before lunch. (laughs) Like, I assumed the meal they were having out in the yard was the lunch scene, but then, like, three scenes later, they're like, oh, it's going to be lunch soon. So that whole, the timing of that whole thing was weird. And also, since they're eating outside, I'm assuming that's not actually taking place at Christmas in Michigan. Hmm, unlikely. But it should at least be taking place in 2008. And the first iPhone was released in June 2007. So Henry, having a flip phone at some point in 2008, again, not unrealistic, perfectly accurate. Good job, show. Top-notch production design, yes. Like a slab phone wouldn't have been completely inaccurate if he had had one at that point, but it's also not at all inaccurate for him to still have a flip phone at that point. Especially somebody who probably doesn't want to carry anything expensive because, you know... He's going to vanish and leave it behind at some point. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he's going to be a man with basically a series of burners. The only place where they really misstep with the anachronistic technology is when Henry's mother apparently has a cell phone with her at the museum in 1988. That is a tad early, particularly for that model of phone. That phone she has looks much more like a 1994 phone, not a 1988 phone. And in 1988, the only people who would have portable phones like that would have been rich business assholes. Claire's parents. Yeah, possibly. Claire's father could have had a cell phone, and it would have been like the size of a lunchbox. So that was their only technological misstep. Other than that, very good job. I particularly enjoy the beige LCD monitor in 2004 and that classic 1994 computer tower. Oh, that thing was so pretty. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, we're plugging into our own sense of nostalgia here <laughs> I didn't pay as much attention to the cars in various time zones but I assume they were similarly on point yeah I got nothing for you on cars Mm-hmm. none of them had fins yep none of them had fins definitely post 1957 <laughs>
while we're on episode five and the visit with Claire's family, oh, okay. I know that I'm being a lot more charitable to the show than you are. That much is clear. Everything with Claire's family was incredibly cringy. Oh, incredibly. It was bad. It was bad. You know my least favorite part, though? Can I guess? Oh, I'm very interested to hear your guess, actually. I think your least favorite part is going to be the part where Claire makes up an insipid lie, and then Henry comes in, not knowing that she's lied, makes up a conflicting lie of his own, and then they have to try to coordinate their lies that are increasingly conflicting and increasingly nonsensical in front of Claire's entire family, half of whom are lawyers. Wow, good job. Oh, 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 and it includes lots of implied domestic abuse. (sighs) The thing is, it's such an unforced error. Claire didn't have to make up that lie. This also plays back into the part we talked about earlier where Henry lies to Claire and all of the consequences that happened from that. I do not enjoy watching stories where people make terrible decisions. I enjoy watching stories where people make the best decisions they can in terrible circumstances. Just spitting out a random lie just to fill the silence when you know with 100% certainty that when Henry turns up, he's not going to know what lie you just told. Why would you do that? And then the entire awkwardness and suspicion of the entire rest of the scene is all because of the lie she told. If she had just sat there in silence, then Henry could have turned up and just said, oh, I fell, and that would have been not the most plausible thing in the universe, but plausible enough that it wouldn't have warranted this third-degree interrogation from her brother, who, by the way, is supposed to be her older brother, But in the show, he comes off like her younger brother. Because, in fact, he is younger than her. The actor is younger than the actor playing Claire. But he's supposed to be her older brother. He was her older brother? In the book? It has been so long since I read that book. Okay, alright. Well, even in the show, he's her older brother. Because Rose Leslie is playing a 20-year-old in that scene. We can talk about that later, but Rose Leslie playing her younger self just doesn't work for me. She just looks too mature to be playing that young. The scene where she's at the party, where she's supposed to be 16, and she's 35 playing 16, surrounded by people who I assume are in their 20s playing 16, she just looks visibly older than all of the people around her. It stands out. And in that whole sequence with her family, she is several years younger than her brother. But in the show, she looks older than him because the actress is older than the actor playing her brother. And just the brother's entire demeanor comes off as a younger brother. His entire demeanor, yeah, is pipsqueak kid brother. Yeah. I say that as a kid brother, but not a pipsqueak, damn it. His entire demeanor comes off as annoying younger brother, not overbearing older brother. You say that as an overbearing older brother? (laughs) Well, I mean, I did used to bully you into watching shows I thought you'd like, and now we have a podcast where we review shows, so... (laughs) See, I thought you were going to turn that around and say that I bullied you into watching this show you turned out to hate. Although I think we did mutually decide on this. (laughs) But yeah, that entire thing is just such an unforced error. There was no reason for her to tell that lie. She wasn't, like, cornered into it. She didn't have to give them something, and so she came up with this. She could have just left it unexplained until Henry turned up. Or, and this is another thing that could have happened, and this is another thing I hate in stories, I hate conflicts that could have been resolved with a ten-second conversation But the characters just refuse to have a 10-second conversation. When Claire goes upstairs to check on Henry, they are literally standing six inches apart from each other. All Henry has to do is open the door and say, Hey, 
this happened. Just so you know, we're going to have to explain this to your parents once I finally make it down there. Instead, they just like very deliberately hide that from each other so that she goes downstairs clueless and then spins out this lie that she had no reason to have to actually spin out, but she spins out anyway. As I said before, I don't like watching characters making terrible decisions. Henry randomly time travels to random places, and this is a problem they have to deal with, and this creates a lot of stress and anxiety, and they have to explain away his absences. That's enough issue that they have to deal with in the story. You don't need to add to that by having Claire tell this random lie that she didn't need to. That was not an added complication that was necessary, and that was not a complication that, like, was prompted by the story. That complication was not necessary within the story going on. Yeah, well, the engine of this story in the first place is that sort of collision between the high-concept sci-fi premise and the domestic sphere. That's why the story isn't about the time traveler. The story is nominally about the time traveler's wife. This sort of sequence where the characters, like, sit in their awkwardness and then dig and keep digging, and the awkwardness and the poor decisions just keep cycling and cycling and cycling, this sort of, like, cringe comedy is something that's very common. And it's something that Stephen Moffat, as a former longtime sitcom writer, has some instincts toward. And I hate it every time. I hate it every time. Yeah. It's one of my peccadillos. It's one of your peccadillos. Other people do not have the same peccadillos. I hate it every time. Also, this is another instance where they fell into cliches. You know, whereas the conflict in the book is that the mother gets drunk and has a sort of a breakdown. And the father is just trying to keep a stiff upper lip about the whole thing. Whereas in the show, there's a conflict because the mother doesn't think that Alicia has a prestigious enough job or she's trying to push Claire into some particular avenue of art that Claire apparently doesn't want to go into or something. I don't know. I found that whole part very confusing because her mother refers to Claire as an artist and Claire is literally an artist. But then she keeps stopping and saying, no, I'm not an artist, I'm just an art student. Like, I, I don't understand the distinction being made there. Like, what, is she studying to become, like, an art history scholar and not an artist? I think the idea, kind of like what she's doing with Alicia, is that the mother is putting titles and roles that are too big for the characters, that are different from what the characters want. It's just paralleling. It's the same sort of twisting and embellishment of accomplishments. I mean, the conflict with the family scene in the book wasn't exactly, like, super original, where the mother had some sort of undiagnosed self-medicated mental illness, and so, like, at some point during dinner, she has too much to drink and has to be put to bed. And the father is, like, kind of stuffy, but not that bad. And Claire doesn't really like her brother, doesn't get along with her brother that much, but he's not, like, a total asshole. Like I said, the conflict in the book isn't, like, super original, but it's so much more nuanced and thoughtful than this hackneyed, cliche family conflict that they portray it as in the show. Again, they're sort of falling back on cliches rather than translating the much more interesting story from the book. Also, Sharon was completely absent from that whole sequence. Mm -hmm. I mean, she wasn't like a crucial character. It doesn't affect the story that much. But basically, without having that entire story point there, it sort of frees up Mark to be the asshole that he is in the show. Because he doesn't have his own crisis that he's going through. One thing I did kind of appreciate in that fifth episode was after the sequence with the family, when Claire runs out to the meadow where she spent her childhood with Henry. First, they have Rose Leslie, like, retracing the steps of the child actor during the opening credits of every other episode. That was kind of a neat parallel visually. But also, they have the scene where Henry cuts his hair and then goes out to her, 
as a sort of visual cue that he understands it's time to start turning into the more mature Henry. Like, I now know it is time to start growing up. Let's get serious. See, in the book, he does that as soon as he meets Claire. Like, he says that explicitly. I think it's older him that relates it to her, but he's, like, referring back to his behavior at the time. He says something like, that guy recognizes that you are a human being, and you make him want to be one as well. Ooh, I forgot that line. That would have been such a good line to have in the show. Well, there's so much good stuff in the initial Henry and Claire meeting that they eschew in favor of, you know, their big fight and screaming at each other, and Henry being a jerk. I love so much Henry's line about, if I'd known you were coming, I would have cleaned up. My life, I mean, not just the apartment. (laughs) And yeah, older Henry's recounting that he recognizes that you are a human being, and he wants to be one as well. He's trying to pull it all together without you noticing. (laughs) And that's also the scene where Claire recognizes that she's been judging her present Henry by the standards of what she, at 10 years old, thought of 38-year-old Henry. And that's unfair to her present Henry. Also, I gotta say, I kind of like him getting the haircut on the day of the wedding. I thought that was a nice touch. Hmm. I thought that was interesting, where he, he decides to get the haircut the day of the wedding, sort of marking that passage. I liked that touch. I mean, maybe it does, in the show, signal more that he's ready to grow up now. But like I said, in the book, he decided that back when he first met Claire at the library, so it wasn't necessary. Speaking of the wedding, heading into the sixth episode, I made a quick list in my notes of, just off the top of my head, what else do we definitely have to do before the show's over? You know, trying to compress everything. My list was, number one, the wedding. Two, the amputation of his legs and his death. Three, Claire's pregnancies, Henry's vasectomy, and Alba. And my next thought was, this cannot be done in 45 minutes. And while I guess you could do the story without Alba, I don't really think you should. Yeah, that would be a very major change. Well, I mean, they did it without Alba. Alba is not in the program. (laughs) Well, Alba's not in the program because this program ends almost exactly halfway through the book. But I'll be damned if they didn't fit his death in there. I mean, they foreshadowed his death. They literally had the moment of his death. (laughs) They did a lot of that, like, flash-forward foreshadowing things. By the way, did that whole parts of me travel just like the rest of me? Did that come up ever after the end of episode one? There was the blood after he got shot by the father that disappeared. Oh, yeah. The blood hung around just long enough for Claire to see it, but not long enough for anyone else to see it. So they could effectively gaslight her. I forgot that wasn't also in episode one, because it's in episode one where the blood shows up in his bathroom. Yes. And then vanishes before he can clean it. And then it's also at the end of episode one where his feet show up. And then after that, that entire invented plot point doesn't seem to have a point anymore. Like, it was just there for them to foreshadow things in the first episode. It does only come up again in that one moment when he gets shot, yes. It's not like they're in the middle of the dinner scene in the uh, middle of the program and some of his fingernails pop up on the table. This does not occur. So yeah, that was another whole thing they invented for the show that I thought was unnecessary. Well, it's invented to have those two... Three major moments of drama. Yeah. I mean, I guess I understand why they do the flash forwards to hint at things that happen later in the story, but it didn't appeal to me at all. I don't know, maybe I would have found those more interesting if I didn't know what happens later, but as it is, I just... It didn't do anything for me. Some of it felt like it was a little bit on hyperdrive. It felt like one of those sequences, you remember that shows used to do that. They'd do like, this season on our show. And then they'd have like 90 seconds or two minutes of just like little individual couple of second clips previewing like the entire upcoming season of television. That's kind of what a lot of episode six felt like to me. Like episode six was one half the wedding and one half 
coming up on season two of The Time Traveler's Wife. Yes, I kind of understood that as getting in a lot of the story beats in case you don't get season two of The Time Traveler's Wife. The continuing adventures of The Time Traveler's Wife. Well, irregardless, I'm definitely not going to watch season two of The Time Traveler's Wife. Really? Unless we review it for the podcast. Fuck, I'm going to have to watch season two of The Time Traveler's Wife. I was going to say, we did season one, dude. Damned our tendency toward completeness. I mean, the reason I made my little list of, you know, what do you absolutely have to get in before watching the final episode was because going into this season of television, I could not imagine that The Time Traveler's Wife would be the sort of show that would have a season two. I know, I thought the whole point was they were going to tell the story of the book in six episodes. It started to occur to me in episode four. When episode four ended with the dinner at Claire and Charisse's apartment. And in the book, that dinner ends approximately a quarter of the way through the book. And so at that point, I was like, wow, they are really going to have to cram a lot into these last two episodes. And I think it was when episode five was going at the pace it was going when the thought first occurred to me, wait, are they going to have a season two of this show? I honestly did not think about it until I was going into episode six because there was just so much to do. And then they decided to also do the relationship between Henry and his father in episode six, which I think was actually pretty well done. I kind of missed the part where he asks to use his mother's engagement rings. Mm hmm. I thought that was a nice touch that is left out of the show. I really liked the scene where Henry asks his father, was marrying mom worth losing her? I really like that implicit parallel between Henry and Claire's relationship and his parents' relationship. I really like that that is made explicit. Yeah, that was a nice touch. I don't know, I feel like there's a chance I'm not judging episode 6 properly, because after episodes 3, 4, and 5, I was pretty checked out. (laughs) Like, if we weren't reviewing this show for the podcast, I would not have finished the series. Wow. I will admit, I was watching, like, on time as the first two episodes came out, and then I heard that they did the Jason thing in episode three, and I didn't watch the rest of the series for a few weeks. I started watching episode three when it was the most recent episode, and by the time I finished episode three, I was two episodes behind. Oh, that's right. Of course, you have the tendency to, when something gets too hard, to just, like, pause it and come back a few days later, right? Yeah, I was doing that a lot. (laughs) Through episode three, and especially episode five. Yeah, whereas if I'm not feeling something, I'll get to the end of the episode, I just won't maybe watch the next one for a little while. But, I mean, there were moments that I enjoyed. I think the wedding was still pulled off pretty well. The time travel hijinks around the wedding are always fun. See, this is another part where I can't tell if I genuinely don't like the way they did the storyline, or if I just don't like it because it's different from the book. Mm Mm-hmm. So I may not be being entirely fair, but I didn't like that they made him not being there for the wedding because of time travel his own fault. I didn't like that they pushed off the drug-seeking until so close to the wedding rather than having it be months ahead of time like it was in the book. Of course, they massively compressed the timeline from the book, because in the book they get married two years after they meet, whereas in this show they get married the same year they meet. Was that explicit? It says at the wedding, Henry is 28, Claire is 20. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know what time of year a lot of this takes place compared to when their birthdays are, but it's it's within 12 months at the very least. Also, did you notice how they adjusted ages throughout the show? Like, a lot of Henry's time traveling is changed to have him be 28 instead of the various ages he is in the book, which I guess they did because they had a makeup for how he looks at 28, and so they just went with it. Yeah, they chose a few ages. You know, he's 28, he was, there was, what, like a Henry at 38 and a Henry at 42 or something? I think so, yeah. But yeah, they chose a a few ages to have, like, defined looks. So that, for instance, in all the multi-Henry scenes, 
you are familiar with visually how each Henry looks. They also aged up young Henry. Like, he's supposed to do his first time travel when he's five, but they changed it in the show to be, I forget if they did seven or eight, but they aged him up a few years. I think it was eight. I don't know if they did that just because they couldn't find an actor young enough, or if they just didn't think an actor young enough would be able to carry those scenes. Probably, yeah, because of the more extended sequence with eight-year-old Henry and 28-year-old Henry. Yeah. I thought the child actors did a pretty good job in this show. Especially the young Claire's were way better than the movie. I think the casting in this show is generally really good. The young Henry, I think, fit very well with Theo James. I think Theo James did a great job playing the multiple ages of himself. I thought that teenage Henry, when he was having sex with himself, that guy looks a lot like a younger Theo James. That was yes. really good casting. Yeah, the teenage and the kid Henry, I think, were both really well cast to fit with Theo James. Absolutely. And I agree. I think Theo James, I think Theo James acting was really good. I thought he was really good casting. Yes. I thought the character he was asked to play was not so good, <laughs> but I thought he did a good job with what he was given. He did what was asked of him very well. He did a fantastic job. I mean, aided by like I said, choosing like a few defined ages to have him be so that he would have distinct makeup looks, but also changing his mannerisms and his acting style to fit each of the Henrys that he was playing. I think he carried that off very, very well. And I agree, like you say, I think all of the child actresses they had playing the young Claire's, I think they were all very good. I think they all fit with Rose Leslie very well. Rose Leslie playing 16... Less successful. You have to take that as a bit of a stylized element. We're doing a bit of 90210 there. Yeah, that was like lost level of character anachronism where they like... <laughs> lost is my favorite! Lost is my favorite anachronism where they had like one wig that everyone wore in their young teen flashbacks. Yeah, where they like took Terry O'Quinn and put a wig on him and said, There, he's 35 now. <laughs> Oh, and my favorite, favorite, favorite wig on Lost for young Claire. Oh my god, it was amazing. And there were moments that I think the show really, really got right. The car crash, the, the formative experience for Henry with all of the other Henrys arriving and all of the on-screen captions for all of the Henrys arriving at this moment. Henry is 28 and 8 and 20 and 32 appearing all over the screen. Yeah, that was an excellent use of the captions. That was an amazing scene. They did do that really well. They really put across how often he travels back to that moment, much better than the movie did. Yeah. That's the sort of deft skill in conveying the emotional reality of the time travel at the heart of the story that I expected from Stephen Moffat writing this show. And it's not always... I wish episodes 3, 4, 5, and 6 were as good. Yes, it's not It's not always as successful as, as maybe one, one might have hoped. I mean, Moffat is... He's a problematic fave in that he is problematic and he's a fave, equally. <laughs> but that scene, conveying the emotion through the mechanics of time travel in the story, that is exactly why Stephen Moffat did this show. And because he already adapted the story when he was on Doctor Who, but still. One thing this show did lean into, not as badly as the movie, but also like the movie is the extremely uncomfortable circumstance of Henry and Claire falling in love with Henry is 38 and Claire is 10. That is something that the book goes to great lengths to handle very delicately to try to alleviate all of the issues that can arise in that situation. Because if that storyline is not handled very carefully and very delicately, it becomes like 
very uncomfortable and very problematic. And the book goes to great lengths to handle the story very carefully and very delicately. And both the movie and this show take that storyline and go, Ooh, I can make this uncomfortable and problematic? Ooh. I wasn't a huge fan of that. They do sort of make it extremely clear that it's Claire pursuing Henry and Henry is trying his best not to exert undue influence. We've talked about the problems with some of the ways he goes to that effort, but... Yeah. But still, just like the movie, Claire has scenes in this show where she basically says, this is all preordained, I don't have any choice. I don't remember if she explicitly says you forced this on me in the show like she does in the movie, but she expresses no. that sentiment a couple of times. She doesn't say that much, no. And I mean, that's a big reason why they have 35-year-old Rose Leslie playing 16-year-old Claire. Because if they had a 16-year-old actress in that scene with adult Theo James, Ooh. that would have been super uncomfortable. Yes. I think it's easier to escape the more uncomfortable implications of the story in the form of a novel because you can have half of the novel written from Claire's point of view. Also, you don't visually see the 40-year-old man with the 18-year-old girl. Yes, precisely. <laughs> Although, can I ask on a related note, why did they make Gomez so old? Gomez is supposed to be the boyfriend of Claire's friend and classmate, Charisse. Why did they make him ten years older than all of them? More than ten years older than all of them. He's older than Henry. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe that was supposed to have a parallel age difference, slightly. Like, if that's supposed to be a parallel, it's very, very implicit. There's a scene early on in the show where 30-something Henry is talking to 10-year-old Claire, or whatever age the little girl Claire was, and, you know, he, he refers to her toy horse, and she says, I'm grooming her! And he's like, all right, moving on, Claire. And if that, like, joke was the most explicit reference to the subject of grooming that the show made, that would be perfectly fine, kind of awkward, kind of funny, a decent sitcom line. When they have the scene where Claire turns 18, and Henry launches into, like, halfway into a panic attack at the prospect that she's turned 18 and what she expects now that she's 18, and in his desperation to not be the person who does this, he, like, blurts out, I've been grooming you! That, that was unnecessary. <laughs> There's a difference between lampshading an issue and letting the rest of your show work away from the implications of that issue, and, like, diving back into it and lampshading it again. I think that scene would have been fine if he didn't then go ahead and sleep with her. Like, he goes on this whole thing about, I've been grooming you, this is terrible, but then he goes ahead and sleeps with her. Also, like... Well, there's a couple of points to say about that scene. One is that at the end of episode three, when she is explicitly said to be 16, older Claire recounts he only visited me one time after that. And then they show a scene from the 18th birthday, implying that after that scene where she was 16, Henry didn't visit her for a couple of years until her 18th birthday. Except in the next episode, during the scene that's actually on her 18th birthday, they show Claire's diary of dates when Henry visits, and there's a whole page full of dates that would take place within that year when the previous episode said he didn't visit her at all. And in that episode, she's going on about how terrible it is that she won't see him for two years, when according to the previous episode, she just didn't see him for two years. So that was an inconsistency that jumped out at me. But the other thing that I just found kind of stupid is that, like, as soon as she says, I'm 18, he starts getting skittish and nervous and shying away from her. Like, she hasn't even said anything yet. She hasn't made any requests of him. 
Like, just the bare fact that she's 18 now makes him, like, shy away from her and acts jumpy and nervous in a way that he apparently didn't during any of the visits when she was 17 or 16 or 10. I thought that was kind of silly. It was a very uncomfortable scene. And maybe it was supposed to be. I mean, also, visually, the way that the shot is framed after they sleep together is framed in the exact same way as the post-coital shots of Claire and Charisse and Claire and Gomez. All three of these instances of people sleeping together, probably mistakes. She doesn't actually sleep with Charisse, does she? Like, Charisse just kisses her and then Claire freaks out. I mean, they wind up in bed. Oh shit, you're right, I forgot that scene. Yeah. I for- okay, yeah, that's the le- that's a later scene, but shit, I forgot that. Okay. I'm sorry, I forgot that. That was something else that struck me, that apparently everyone who meets Claire is into her. Like, everyone who meets Claire is, like, immediately in love with her. Except Henry, who is the only one who's supposed to be. Oh, well, he gets there. I mean, I guess Gomez is supposed to be, but... That's another thing where they, like, lean so far into cliches. Like, they have that scene where they're in the bar together, and Henry is, like, warning Gomez off. Mm. Whereas in the book, when he finds out about that, he's like he, like, laughs. Like, Claire says, I slept with Gomez when I was 19, and Henry just sort of starts laughing, and he says, like, shit, I thought you were talking about something that happened, like, last week. Like, he has such a more mature reaction to it in the book. But again, you could say that about a lot of the characterization in this show. Have you seen any of the critical response to this show? I have not. I finished watching it literally earlier today, (laughs) so I haven't read anything about it. Uh, I looked at a few reviews. I looked at the Rotten Tomatoes page, so take that for what it's worth. But in general, it looks like in terms of critical response... It's pretty negative. Audience scores are very high. Apparently, in terms of, like, streaming metrics for HBO Max, it's done pretty well. But the critical reception is not very good, although frustratingly, as is very frustrating, when I like certain elements of something but have issues with some or many elements of something, and the critical reception is rather negative, The critics are kind of harping on the wrong thing in some ways. Like, all of the negative critical reviews that I've seen are just about the squick factor in terms of the relationship with the little girl. Which, you know, is a thing, but the story is, to an extent, about the thing. I mean, that's unavoidable with the premise. Yeah. Much of it is an issue with the premise, yes. I mean, I guess I can understand that perspective, but again, it's just sort of inherent in the premise. It's like giving a Spider-Man movie a bad review because of all of the child endangerment. (laughs) How can you let this high schooler fight Thanos? Thumbs down. (laughs) Well, all in all, I think I speak for both of us when I say I can't wait for season two. Like a vault. Oh, that's another thing we forgot to mention. They erased Henry's Jewish heritage again. Yeah, he's... Yeah, he... Yep. His mother's funeral was definitely not a Jewish funeral. Oh, God, yeah, I didn't even think of that in the funeral scene. Yeah, not Jewish in the least. But who is? That'll do it for us. That'll do it for the time traveler's wife. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for the show... You can find us at nontoxicfanboys on Twitter and Facebook, or you can email us at nontoxicfanboys at gmail.com. If you'd like to support the show, get episodes early and hear an exclusive monthly behind-the-scenes podcast where we talk about the making of the show, you can do that at patreon.com slash nontoxicfanboys. And you can find all of this info, plus every episode of the podcast and all of our other accounts, like our YouTube channel, our Twitch channel, and our Discord server, all listed at our website, nontoxicfanboys.com. Thank you all for listening. We will see you next time.
I just remembered. Do you want to say anything about the score? I didn't have time to listen to it. Oh, they did release an album? I didn't even know that. Yeah, it came out like around the last episode. The opening theme was nice. I mean, there were a couple of moments of music I liked in the show, but yeah, I haven't. I've seen the show once and I haven't listened to the album at all, so yeah, okay. I guess it's just as well. Yeah. 